Welcome to IdeaGen TV. Today we are especially thrilled and excited and honored, most importantly, to have with us the EU ambassador to the United States, Stavros Lambrinidis. Mr. Ambassador, welcome. Great to be here, George. It's always an honor to have you on IdeaGen TV to hear from someone that we believe exhibits true leadership and uh, Today is a, is a moment in time in the middle of this global pandemic where you have the, the incredible task of helping to interface on behalf of the European Union with the United States, which is um, an incredible opportunity to tell the story, to negotiate, and to connect the dots on this transatlantic relationship. Uh, you have an incredible background, of course, in diplomacy and uh, I'd like to ask, what was the diplomatic sector like when you first began your career? <laughs> Less virtual. Less <laughs> virtual. That's for sure. Good point. Uh, I don't know. You know, George, I mean, the, the diplomacy is a contact sport in some ways. Um, uh, not just because uh, you build entirely different types of personal relations when you, you know, have a chance to bid next to someone, you know, watch them react to what you say. Um, um, uh, listen to them and try to understand where they're coming from. All those things sometimes get lost, uh, not totally lost, but they, they, they tend to get lost uh, uh, through a distance. But also because of the hundreds of connections you usually make uh, in different kinds of events. Uh, you know, we met uh, last year uh, in, in a room full of people. I had a chance to, uh, you know, say hello and to exchange a few words with so many people who I otherwise wouldn't have met. Uh, some of whom, uh, you know, could, uh, you know, probably say a good word about what we do. Others inform me of good things they do. All this stuff, by definition, gets lost. So, you know, I do look forward to the moment that we'll be able to just be back um, in full swing diplomatic mode. Another thing I would say about diplomacy uh, more broadly is that um, it feels sometimes that it has become a, uh, a much more bilateral sport, sport uh, outside of the uh, multilateral rules-based order and discussion that we usually we used to base many discussions on. Um, if you have a point of reference, um, you know, on many issues around the world today, and those points of references tend to be more effective when they have come out of a multilateral contest with many countries many different views have managed to agree on, uh, on some parameters to work on, uh, then it's easy to keep people up to their commitments um, when they make them. Uh, and when they do not keep up, then it's easy to identify what has gone wrong. Um, outside of that context, and increasingly uh, there are countries around the world who would rather go it alone or a notion that might is right. Outside of that context, sometimes it's much more difficult to, uh, to be able to promote um, uh, global goals. And when I say global goals, I think that COVID has brought to the forefront the reality um, that uh, when you're dealing, for example, with a global virus, uh, the only way you can really effectively address the issues that come out of that is if you do it globally. Uh, because, you know, we cannot stop it at our borders. Uh, and even if we manage to, if it rages out there in the world, it will eventually come back in. Uh, so there is a huge responsibility, I feel, for, the, for diplomacy today to manage to, uh, to return to the fundamental roots of diplomacy after Second World War, which was to use words, in fact, not guns, uh, not power, uh, use persuasion, use values, uh, to be able to build a world that is very different than the terrible world that we saw back then. And if we manage to uh, reignite that commitment to multilateralism, not necessarily with the um, sclerosis the system may have developed over the de decades. You always address those, you always try to correct them. But if we manage to keep there and bring all countries around the world, even those that we disagree with on many issues, Americans and Europeans, in that context and manage to affect them there, I'm hopeful. Well, that's incredible context, of course. And um, I hope you're right. I, and I know you're right um, in terms of um, the a, po a more positive direction. And so we're currently on this runway to 2030. The, the global goals, the global goals, those 17 global goals of the United Nations, 
We're hoping for completion of those goals of the 17 goals. And do you think that based on all we've seen, including this current situation, that we are still on track and why? Well, I can tell you the European Union is more or less on track. Uh, and I think that's, uh, uh, that's important because uh, we have always been uh, showing leadership uh, when it came to the sustainable development goals from the moment that they were discussed to the moment they were voted on. And then, of course, when it came to implementation. Um, we have even included now the SDGs in our own internal processes of reviewing uh, budgetary commitments, member state by member state in the EU, making sure that we also check at a European level whether our member states are implementing the SDGs, uh, whether there are um, the new ideas or new ways that we can actually do it better together. Uh, and uh, we also focus quite extensively on supporting countries around the world, including economically, financially, uh, to be able to achieve uh, those goals themselves. Um, let's not forget a fundamental or two umbrella priorities under, under which all the SDGs lie. One of them is a slogan, it's a slogan of the F SDGs, uh, but it is crucially important, and we see this again now with COVID, is leave no one behind. So when you're thinking of sustainable development, it's very important that you understand that uh, economic um, development uh, can go hand in hand with greater economic inequality. And if you have that kind of development with inequality going up at the same time, that is a recipe for social unrest uh, and for um, and, and in the end of the day for potentially collapsing of, e of economies and societies. So trying to get rid of the inequality as we promote the, uh, the economic development is huge. And look at COVID. It has exposed the cracks in uh, the inequality cracks, even in very advanced societies such as our own. Uh, even more so in poorer countries around the world that are being hit by this and do not really have the uh, finances to be able to address their health systems and the social protection systems in addition to economic development uh, and investment and all these other things they have to do. So uh, what we are doing as Europeans is not only focusing to make sure that we put our money where our mouth is, as it were, internally, addressing some of these inequalities internally in the EU, uh, but also do so um, internationally. Uh, take internal and COVID in the EU. Uh, we have announced, uh, the European Commission has announced a plan of about uh, uh, 750 billion euros, even more, for uh, a development, uh, a recovery fund uh, coming out of the COVID crisis. It's interesting that we have announced that we want to spend that money not equitably in terms of everybody gets a particular share of that pie, uh, given the size of the economy or what have you, but in a solidaire way. So give that money mostly to those European Union member states, those industries, those regions in Europe that have been most hard hit by COVID. And these are tremendous measures of solidarity in a European Union that a few years back during the financial crisis uh, was in a very different place, uh, very concerned about uh, moral hazard, about um, allowing money to go to countries or regions that um, were um, weaker uh, economically, uh, unless there were a lot of conditions in place, etc., etc. That kind of solidarity is not charity. It is fundamental to ensure that we in Europe uh, can recover from COVID with uh, a level playing field, ensuring that our internal market is uniform and strong. And that kind of economic boom is going to ensure that we can also apply the SDGs both internally and around the world. Look at the way that we're dealing now with um, the Team Europe approach, as we call it, European Union plus member states plus the European Investment Bank in amassing funds, about 36 billion euros to date, to be able to give to the poorest countries around the world as they are trying to address uh, the systemic uh, problems in their economies that don't allow them to deal with uh, COVID in an effective way. All these are very important. So I think that as you ask the question, uh, 
uh, how do we apply now uh, the SDGs? My answer is we can, we are. We have to retain the political commitment around them, and in the EU we do. But we also have to manage to show world leadership. And I do not think that any leadership can be stronger than the one shown by Americans and Europeans together, if that is possible. Because at the same time that we are the two biggest, most open, most free economies in the world, we are also by far the biggest development aid donors around the world. And so as we try to help the world move to the SDGs, being together and sending the message together could bring hope. And hope in politics, as you know, George, is very important. Uh, many people can just go back and say, oh, my God, look at this, you know, COVID. We already had, you know, poverty and inequality. Things are terrible. Uh, you know, what are you talking about now? SDGs, what is that? Some UN thing, forget it. You know what? Right. It's doable. It's hugely important for the uh, collective security and prosperity of our people, including our own. And we can do it together. Well, and that's what we appreciate uh, so very much with your leadership and that of the European Union. I think the the focus on the global goals is is so important because as we remind folks, as we create awareness for these goals at IdeaGen, which is a backdrop for everything that we do, I think it's important to note that the United States is part of these goals and they were agreed to unanimously by the United Nations. And so a fundamental difference between those and the and the MDGs, the Millennial Development Goals, is that it was really based on more developing country focus. Now we're looking at and we're seeing, and you, you just incredibly well articulately highlighted the issues, especially here in the United States with everything that's happened recently with equity and equality being the topic and the focus um, on major headlines. What this, what this pandemic has done is refocused the issue on the inequalities and the inequity uh, that exists in communities across the world and right here in the United States, as you mentioned. And so I think we have an opportunity in highlighting the goals to say, wait, you know, inequality exists across the planet. This global pandemic perhaps has highlighted it in ways that were unprecedented. And in the United States, for example, we hear time and time again in our interviews with folks like yourself and global leaders, you know, that zip codes are an issue. As we all know, here in the United States, if you're fortunate enough to be in a good zip code and a good zip code, as they say, then you have a better school system or you have a better health care system or you have access um, access to better and more nutritious food. So we know where uh, the problem areas lie. I think it's incredibly admirable to hear all of the focus areas that you're working on with the European Union to help other countries as well and to do better and to do more good, which I think is what we're talking about here. And so shifting a bit, I'd like to ask you, how are you and your colleagues navigating this new world? I mean, you're in diplomacy. It's not easy to be a diplomat when you have to do it virtually. It's sort of like what we're doing today. We've met before, so it makes it a little bit easier, but for those you're meeting for the first time or trying to get a message across to on important, you know, issues relating to diplomacy. How have you adapted to that? Well, um, I'd say one is the issue of substance. The other one is the issue of form. So when it comes to substance, uh, I have focused on, on what, what, whatever lessons and whatever stories the European Union could bring to the transatlantic discussion when it comes to COVID itself. Uh, and I have reached out and I've kept reaching out myself and, uh, and the 120 people we have at the embassy here in Washington uh, to all our American interlocutors from the administration to Congress, to civil society, to states, uh, to be able to build partnerships around those lessons. Um, we saw that health, for example, was not and still is not a main competence of the EU. Uh, so the EU, just like U.S. states here, has a federalism, uh, uh, broad speaking, we're not a federal state, but, you know, federalism principle. So the EU has the powers that the member states independently give to it, but also they retain powers that they decide that they want to keep on the, for themselves. And one of these powers was health. 
And when uh, the, the, the crisis broke out, initially the first couple of weeks, we worked very much um, uh, individually, one might say even more selfishly, trying to address the individual crises in each member state. And we realized pretty quickly that wouldn't work uh, because we are interconnected, because we have no uh, restrictions in traveling within the EU, because of the fact that we were at different stages of being able to procure um, uh, PPE equipment, other stuff like that. And we very quickly turned uh, member states to the EU and said, let's do this together. And once we said that, the, uh, the, uh, the, there was an, an, an ocean shift in what we managed to achieve. So we mobilized more than 3.5 trillion euros, uh, both the EU itself uh, and member states through uh, bending EU rules in place about deficits and debts and what you can spend, what you cannot spend for immediate support, both to our health systems, uh, to save lives, but also to save livelihoods. Um, we mobilized funds that ensured that people would stay at work and that employers could keep paying them as opposed to laying them off. Um, because we already in Europe, as you know, have very extensive social safety nets, unemployment benefits, uh, you know, health benefits. Sure. Uh, every European citizen can go to a hospital and be treated without being afraid that they cannot mm -hmm. afford it. Uh, at the same time, uh, we, we wanted to make sure that people were not laid off. Uh, you know, some would be and have been, it's inevitable. But our emphasis was in creating a fund that could support small and medium enterprises and others in keeping people in work. So when the economy kickstarts again, they would be ready to immediately start contributing to it as opposed to having to be rehired or having fallen in a place where they are long-term unemployed, they don't feel they have any, any opportunities. We procured together PPE equipment. So we, we decided that instead of every EU member state going out and fighting it on its own in the international market, that all member states would get together under the EU umbrella and the EU would procure for all of us the equipment that we needed, the ventilators, the masks, the gloves, everything else. And that allowed us to, to put out huge bids at very competitive prices uh, with suppliers around the world. So we did a bunch of things, and I think that all that, um, including then the measures we took internally to bend the curve, and we have managed to be quite successful in this, um, I, I, on substance, the kind of uh, things that the U.S. public and the U.S. administration and others were very interested in, and we, we did that outreach. Now, when it comes to the form, how do you do it? Um, we have been teleworking. So... Uh, back in March, before even D.C. closed down, um, I sent uh, all the staff in the embassy home. Um, we, uh, we started um, teleworking back then. Um, we had uh, very few people in the, in the embassy at any particular moment, very few. Uh, and we kept that until June when we started opening up again with a skeleton staff uh, and with um, tremendous health precautions. Uh, you wouldn't be able to come in, George. I mean, I would love to have you to the embassy, but you wouldn't be allowed, for example. Okay. Right. Uh, so, wow. um, and, uh, and uh, you know, uh, recently we moved up to a 20% uh, presence in the delegation against shifting around and all that. Now, has that affected our ability to do our work? When it comes to um, outreach and, and reporting, mostly. So, a big part of our work is talking to people, uh, understanding what's happening in the country uh, in uh, virtually every field of endeavor, whether it's trade or, um, uh, you know, the environment or uh, foreign policy. Um, in all the staff, we've managed to keep our contacts very close by through VDCs or phone calls. Uh, and we've been very effective at, uh, at, at, doing, uh, at doing that job. Then we had a challenge. On how do we do major events? Uh, because we had some major events planned. Uh, and one of them just took place. It is the European uh, Union's uh, Defense Washington Forum, as we call it. So every year we have a major security and defense conference in which we bring together, um, you know, uh, from generals to commissioners to secretaries here in the U.S. to others to discuss European and American cooperation on defense and security, the new challenges, where things are going, China, everything. And there... Initially, we were very concerned that this was going to be a disaster because really the value of those things are to get together and to meet with people. But we managed to do it in a virtual way that was, uh, in the end of the day, remarkably successful because we found that we could have people who normally would not fly to the States to do this, more willing to do it from an office in Brussels or somewhere else. 
So sure. a little more stilted, uh, if you like, because this is a little more stilted than being in a room and having those interactions. But uh, a lot of people participating and more than 50 million interactions in the social media in, in a matter of two days. So we saw and we are learning about how to do those things uh, more effectively, I have to say, as well. So, George, you know, we are all learning um, from this. Uh, but I'll tell you one thing that those numbers and the, and, and the impressions in social media and all that stuff cannot tell you. I've been roaming the, the empty halls of the delegation the past few weeks, bumping very rarely into the few people in. And every time I do, I see a big smile on their faces under those masks. Maybe I see the smile in the eyes. And we all say, boy, we're so happy to be back. I mean, we need each other's inspiration in the office. We need the interaction. We need to throw around ideas that you know, just will come flippantly and then they will blossom into something new uh, in the relationship. We need to have guests coming in uh, that we can talk to. Uh, so I think that we are all looking forward to the day uh, that we'll be able to be back together and run this diplomacy business uh, as a contact sport. Uh, but we as Europeans in this town, uh, as proud, a proud temporary citizens of America as we serve in this country, we committed ourselves that we will be at the front lines of flattening this curve. We will not take risks. We will, by example, try to show what we can contribute to this community, which is to keep it safe uh, and keep it growing and keep it strong. And we will follow all the advice until the moment comes that we can be together again. You know, that's, um, again, an eloquent and very articulate you know, description of what you're what you're encountering and, and certainly the leadership again that you're displaying is obviously based on science and you're trying to look at the data points and the EU has been, you know, obviously leading with the United States in that area on so many different levels. And so that leads me to what many refer to as the new normal. I think I heard a little bit about you know, the the hearkening back to what it used to be like, uh, do you see in a in a post pandemic world things coming back close to normal or is there a new normal? Will you, for example, implement more of a telework combination or has there been any thought there on how things will change and what does that new normal look like? Well, we were, uh, we, we were interestingly, uh, George, we were the, the EU embassy here in Washington was one of the few uh, embassies in, a, in an EU pilot project on teleworking that uh, was instituted uh, way before the pandemic. So we were looking and are looking at ways to be able to ensure that our staff can be productive and happy um, in, uh, not in, uh, on, a, on a regular basis, teleworking, but, but allowing that flexibility uh, in a quite wider range of options than, than normally might exist. So I think that what we've learned here now during COVID will help us implement this even more effectively. I have to say uh, that more broadly, um, many times when we talk about uh, a new normal, uh, we, uh, we tend to forget that there are many workers in this country and in Europe uh, for whom teleworking is not really an option. Uh, the blue collar worker, um, in, in, in this country, uh, many, um, many people having these jobs, African-Americans, Hispanics, other minorities. Um, those kinds of um, situations uh, would uh, require returning not to a new normal, but to, in some ways to an old one. So ensuring that everyone, no matter what their job is, uh, and, where, and especially if their job cannot be done um, uh, relatively effectively through, through the VDC, that they can be back on the ground in jobs, working hard uh, and, uh, and bringing, um, you know, uh, uh, bread to their family table. So uh, we have been thinking very much and very hard about the social consequences of, uh, of COVID. And I think this is something that, that you will see as well coming out of the pandemic. Look, there is fundamentally what happened with COVID is that we had to deal with two simultaneous existential crises and threats to the world. Before COVID, it was climate change. With COVID, it was COVID together with climate change. And we had to deal with those of, with both of those at the same time. Extremely taxing on time, energy, political will, uh, resources. 
But the fact is that we, as Europeans, as we come out of this crisis, um, we have determined that we will not be doing um, the old normal when it comes to our economic development. We will be focusing on a um, sustainable green economic growth in Europe, and we will be fo focusing on a digital growth in Europe. So um, environmentally sustainable and digital will be the two growth engines of the EU as we come out of this. And we have shown to ourselves in the past um, uh, 30 years uh, that these goals uh, are not um, conflicting with, uh, with GDP growth, but in fact, they support it. If you just were to take, uh, you know, um, the environmental aspect of it, uh, we have reduced our carbon emissions in Europe from 1990 to today by more than 22 percent. And we have increased at the same time our GDP growth by more than 60 percent. So carbon emissions down, GDP growth up. These are not conflicting. And as we look at what the new normal might be in economic growth, it cannot be that we look at the 20th century black polluting economy as a way out. We have to move forward to an entirely different uh, economic model. And we have seen in Europe that by investing in alternative energy sources, alternative te uh, technologies, um, we have already made humongous economic strides. Keep in mind that the 60% GDP growth that I mentioned between 1990 and today covered a couple of decades where all green energy technologies were not even close to economies of scale. Now they are. So as Europe, as European Investment Bank, as European Commission under Ursula von der Leyen, the, uh, the, the president of the commission, uh, as European Parliament, as member states, we are making commitments now for a new normal, if you like, that looks quite different from the old normal when it comes to uh, the sources of growth, but we hope we'll look uh, very closely at the economic inequalities and ensure that everyone that in this new normal cannot have a job has it. It's effective and it's strong. Classic example, we have announced major investments on transitioning from dirty energy to clean energy. But we know that there are tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of Europeans today that their livelihoods depend on working at coal mines or working at, at, at other uh, industries in ways that are um, uh, polluting in a way that we said we cannot have. So we haven't allowed those people to fall by the wayside. We have also formed a uh, solidarity fund to ensure that billions of euros from the next budget of the European Union go directly to supporting people who will be dislocated because of this green transition in Europe. So we are very clear eyed, very hard headed, not, not, not romantic at all, although Europeans sometimes are accused of being too romantic about those things. Uh, we know where real growth lies and we're going to be investing there and we're going to be making sure that no one is left behind to tie it back to the SDG goals that we discussed at the beginning. Incredible insights and certainly the perspectives that you bring are powerful. And I think a model uh, for the rest of the world to look at, in, including the United States on so many different levels, uh, in so many different interviews as of late, the topic of the business case for achieving the SDGs, which is sort of what you were describing as well, has been made that, by the way, a company can, you know, invest more in sustainable, et cetera, make more profit perhaps, but at the same time be able to do more good. And, and that's a cycle. And so what do you see Mr. Ambassador as the best approach for achieving those 17 goals of the United Nations? Well, I think the first thing that we have to do and we have to recognize is that post-COVID, there's a real fundamental problem with money. We need major investments for the SDGs and uh, countries and economies are reaching their debt limits. Uh, and in many instances, especially in poorer developing countries, this is a real major crisis. So. Um, 
you know, on May 28th, uh, the uh, the European Commission president made a proposal uh, for a recovery in initiative that links um, investment and debt relief uh, to the Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, it is uh, very important to be able to um, support countries that right now basically have no money to spend uh, on, on anything, let alone uh, SDG uh, goals to help them do it. Then the second thing that we have to um, understand as we move to achieving the SDGs is that we gave a fight, uh, Europeans certainly did back in 2014, 2015, to ensure that human rights uh, and gender equality are included within those goals, either as separate goals or as sort of a silver, a silver lining that goes throughout. Um, and there's a very good reason for this. Um, I mean, as we're trying to develop, and we see this already today, uh, there are countries that will be running around the world giving money or claiming they give money, whereas in fact they are loaning money. And doing so uh, with uh, terrible conditions uh, that create debt traps potentially for those who borrow that money. Uh, doing so in, uh, in ways that ensure that investments do not protect the environment. In fact, on the contrary, uh, investments pollute and therefore they are cheap. Uh, in, in their mind, right? Uh, doing so in ways that do not protect uh, labor rights. Um, and um, in that sense, Americans and Europeans have a tremendous interest to ensure that as the biggest development donors in the world, and in the end of the day, as the biggest also um, foreign direct investment, private investment exporters in the world, that this world uh, develops in a way that respects those values. And that values debate was perhaps not really in our, in our radar screens a few years back, but it really surely is now. I've said in the past, every time a European exports a particular product in a container, in that container, we also export our values, protecting the environment, free open markets uh, with free competition and open competition, protecting labor rights, uh, anti-corruption, uh, democratic governance. These are values. And increasingly other countries around the world are exporting their values in their containers. And they are very different values than ours. Mm -hmm. So as we are looking at sustainable development, we must make sure that it is green, it is fair, it is transparent. It promotes the rights of every citizen. It ensures that 50% of the population who are women have a right and an ability to participate in that economy and therefore truly help grow it, but also reap the benefits of that. And all these things are not just good values. They are hard-headed, important economic realities that unless we follow, we will be in a world where others can compete better than we can in because they are not as rigid and as strict about protecting those values that we protect. Incredibly admirable and again, pointing back to the leadership and especially on the issue of equity and equality, uh, the European Union, certainly in the work that you're doing and in interfacing with the United States, that's been a hallmark of the EU's leadership. And so that is incredibly admirable. And so I think you mentioned a few of these, but what do you see as some of the key inhibitors to reaching the goals? I, 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 think, I think, George, the first one is money. Uh, we need more and we need fast. Uh, the second one is um, the type of growth we were pursuing. Uh, we need uh, green growth uh, because the planet is in a real existential danger and this has not gone away. In fact, it could get worse. Um, and uh, we need to focus on that. We need digital growth because many countries, especially developing countries right now, you take Africa, other parts around the world, um, those countries can leapfrog development if they go into digital fast, as can we. And therefore, simply looking at development for many in many parts of the world, assuming that, you know, because they're down here, they have to climb a little bit and be where we were 20 years ago in 10 years' time. That's not going to work, right? So there's there's that kind of thing that needs to that needs to go through, and there needs to be uh, international cooperation and political will. And the political will ties again with multilateralism. Um, we in Europe see the success of SDGs around the world as a prerequisite for our own economic growth 
uh, and for our own ability to live in a world that is not dangerous, is, is more or less peaceful uh, and more or less fair and equitable, which then reflects and projects back to, to us as well and to many of our interests, including, for example, ensuring that people in different parts of the world can have decent jobs, not be exploited, have their rights protected so they don't feel the need to escape those countries and try to migrate desperately to places like Europe. So all these ties together, uh, solidarity is not charity. And in that way, and in that way of thinking, we hope that we may be able to inspire others, including uh, many friends of ours in the US, to join hands in this effort. Um, we cannot simply get out of this crisis by just boosting up our own GDP or treating our people with our own vaccines. Uh, the EU, you want to take the vaccines. We've taken an initiative, uh, two major conferences, uh, collecting more than 15 billion euros to support all these multilateral consortia out there and the WHO and others and the, and the Gates Foundation um, who are trying to develop treatments, vaccines and preventive medications now for COVID and for other potential future COVIDs, right? So we just don't think that this can be done alone. And we don't think that if we get this vaccine, the smart thing for us to do would be to actually give it to our Europeans. Of course, we'll give it to Europeans. But we have to make sure that it goes equitably immediately around the world, wherever it's needed most. You will not be able to supply 6 billion people immediately. You have to figure out to make those decisions. Okay, it's never easy. You know, it's a discussion. But it cannot just be you. Because, you know, we see this all the time. We are global economies, the Americans and the Europeans. We, you know, our people, our business people, our, our, our government people travel every day all over the world to 200 countries. And we do it every day because that's where our interests lie. If we cannot open up economies around the world because of the fear of COVID, it is us, the most open economies, relying on that international trade and investment that will be hit as hard as anyone at the end of the day. So it is both humanitarian reasons and economic reasons that I think obligate us to be thinking about our leadership role in the world right now. We have to be leaders. We cannot be simply inward looking uh, because if we do that, others will be running around the world acting like Mother Teresa's and we'll be looking like we are the selfish uh, you know, uh, Westerners and we are not. We're the biggest providers of development aid in the world, as I told you. This is huge. European Union, we are what, 8% of the world's population, about 7? About 22% of the world's economy? We are more than 57% of all the world's development aid. 8% of the world's population and 22% of the world's economy, the EU and its member states, provide 57% of world development aid. I'm proud of that as a European. And I think that we should be joining hands, Americans and Europeans, because our collective firepower is unmatched. You know, <laughs> as, a, as an American and a Greek American at that, I, I could not be more proud to hear those words. As, and I've seen uh, here at IdeaGen your commitment to building this EU-US relationship. It's, it's just incredibly remarkable. And you've hit upon the notion of leadership. And Mr. Ambassador, why do you believe that effective leadership combined with innovation are so crucial now more than ever? Well, let's try to define this leadership. I, I think it's more, I think it's, it's important more than ever because this is a world uh, in shift. And because countries in the, in the past who were simply content in having repressive systems, uh, and telling you, look, don't criticize me, I have my sovereignty, leave me alone. I'm not content with that anymore. They are much happier to try to export their values and the system to others. And that is creating a world that needs democratic leadership to ensure that it stays in the right track. Now more than ever, it needs a multilateral system, whether it's the United Nations or the UN Human Rights Council or the World Health Organization, the World Trade Organizations, all these institutions that the, that the United States led uh, decades ago to put together uh, with Europeans together and allowed us to have the biggest time of prosperity and peace in the world based on our values, those universal values, 
those organizations will be more needed today than before. Because otherwise, we could go to a world that without our leadership, uh, they could start reflecting the values of others, or others will simply try to build a parallel multilateral system or regional system of their own uh, that has nothing to do with what we are trying to achieve in terms of, uh, of, 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 of a world that we are dreaming of. Okay, So we also have to show leadership because the world is thirsting for a sign that especially when a virus that, like this hits, um, it is global solutions with the EU and the US at the front lines uh, that can best address them, not might in, is right and not um, shutting our shelves in our, in our shells. Let me give you two examples on this that relate only partially to COVID, but also show point to the type of leadership that I believe we should be showing right now. One has to do with Venezuela. People had forgotten if they ever knew, and frankly, COVID took it entirely off the headlines, that about 5 million people have forcefully left Venezuela, migrated out of Venezuela in the past few years. About 4 million of those people are now located in three or four countries, mainly around Venezuela and Latin America. At the time of COVID, those countries' health systems and social systems have been stretched to the max. Who's going to support those countries to ensure that the biggest migration crisis after Syria today in the world can be handled in a humane way that allows those people leaving to temporarily, hopefully, have a shelter somewhere else before they return back home, but also to ensure that those societies receiving them do not collapse under the pressure of the new needs for social protection, health protection, etc. So we set up the EU a Venezuela pledging conference the other month, in which we managed to get more than two and a half billion euros from countries around the world who pledged, including the US, to be able to support multilateral organizations such as UNHCR uh, and uh, the International Organization for Migration and others to support those countries. Now, you wouldn't think that this is the kind of leadership that immediately pops in mind when you think in COVID, but you see how interlinked they are. You see how much we need to be ahead of the, of the curve here in order to be able to see those things. Another country in Africa, a different continent, Sudan. Sudan is probably the only country that has a chance to have a successful democratic transition in a very long time that we have seen in that continent. But it's supremely fragile, that transition, and the democratic government that is in place right now. And it needs support from the multilateral institutions. It needs support from the IMF. It needs support from the World Bank. Sudan, part of the legacy of the old regime under Bashir, when he was there a year and some months ago, is still on the US uh, countries of terrorism list. And so we've been talking very much with the U.S. counterparts about the great importance that we both place on finding ways to support that country in spite of any legal or other obstacles in the way, because this is a country that if it goes the wrong way, a huge part of Africa is suddenly destabilized again. And uh, a, an old cartel of, uh, you know, uh, extreme Islamists and uh, military um, uh, leaders uh, takes over. So when I say leadership, if you like, George, and I'm sorry if this is a long answer that could get maybe some of your people yawn, but my job is not to always entertain with some nice one-liner. My job, as diplomacy's job, in fact, is to be able to see where the ant's work needs to be done and what that ant's work means and how you put those coalitions together, European Union, World Bank, IMF, private sector. How do you get those coalitions together to ensure that something that may never hit the headline in your country, nevertheless, will bring security and prosperity and peace in the long term, and frankly, will may, maybe will take a headache away from you 10 years down the line when terrorism and war breaks out somewhere. That's the work. It's not easy because it doesn't always get recognized. 
uh, because it's not always headline grabbing, but I see it as an obligation of Americans and Europeans to do that ants work. And, and if uh, and if we do it uh, together with the big stuff we got to do, I'm optimistic. I really am optimistic, even during these very hard times. Well, your optimism is obviously contagious, and I think the the practical approach to not just um, in essence, relying on what is um, on the front page of any newspaper on the television as, as being the focus for your work is is incredible. And that's the definition, again, of leadership. It's being able to look around the corner, to peer around the corner, to see things that are coming at you that most maybe aren't paying attention to or can't see in general. And I think that that lays out the foundation for avoiding the the future headlines, the negative future headlines that unfortunately drive a lot of what we see each and every day. I like the way you put it, George. I really like it. Leadership is, is, is the ability to, pe to, 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 to peek around the corner. I think it's great. That's true. Yeah. Well, and, and, that's, and that's, you know, it's, <laughs> that's the way I see it because it's, it's ultimately what you just described. And, and I think leadership also now applies to this next question, which is focused on providing a, a glimpse into advice for future global leaders. So if we were to go back in time, when you first started your career, what advice would you give to yourself and why? Oh. You know, I remember I was in college in the States and, and um, I had a couple of uh, classmates of my brilliant kids um, who knew exactly what they, what they were gonna do, what they wanted to do in their lives. One wanted to be a senator, I remember that. Another one, uh, uh, you know, wanted to be um, a, uh, uh, you know, work for an NGO on the environment from back then. I mean, they absolutely knew. Uh, they wanted to be leaders. And I remember we had heated discussions with them because what I asked them at the time was why. And if I have any advice to give to people who want to get engaged in anything is you have three questions to ask yourself and each one has an increasing level of difficulty in answering. So the first question is what? What do you want to do? I want to be a senator, okay? The second question is how? How are you going to do what you want to do? Fewer people, if you ask them today, know how they're doing what they're doing. They know what they're doing, okay? But how is comes down to all the nitty gritties of, you know, what it is they have to do to be successful at being a senator, at being an NGO leader, at being a, a, an ambassador. But both of those things, even if you manage to ask them to answer them correctly, don't really go to the gist of who you are and the gist of who you are, what is going to make you content, if not happy in life and fundamentally What's going to convince all those people to interact around you, to take you seriously, in my view, is answering the question, why? Why do you want to do those things? Because if it is naked ambition, if it is just an intellectual um, concept of where the world should be going, if there is no real seed in you that makes you want to achieve those things, then Good luck to you. You may even be very good, but you could also be very dangerous. Naked ambition, running around trying to be the best of this and the best of that. You know, get things done sometimes, but it also can get someone to a point of power which they will mismanage because they do not know their why. I don't, you know, I've been asking myself my why so many times and it's very difficult to answer it really is but i'll tell you i've been very involved in inequalities um throughout virtually everything i've done in my life from being a lawyer to i've been focused very much on human rights on inequalities economic ones and other ones and george you know i think you know when i was a young kid my parents my parents died when i was very young and I grew up in a uh, in a boarding school in, in Greece. And you know, my family was a uh, was a, was a well-off family, lawyers and all that stuff. And you know, suddenly I you know I was in a room with eight other young 
boys from who were there with a scholarship from different parts of Greece, poor kids who excelled in a scholarship competition and were there. And I suddenly realized that the life that I have had, even that little life as a young kid before all that other stuff happened, had nothing to do with the difficulties they were facing and the different, different perspectives from which they were coming. So I think that resonated in me in a, in a deep, in a very deep way. I don't know if I'm good at what I'm doing, but at least I know my why. I want to be able, if I can, in whatever I do, to bring a little more decency and equality in a society and in a life that can be real hard. And that motivates me. I have no personal ambitions. I've never had. And you can say, oh, come on. You're the, you're the U EU ambassador of the US, obviously. No, I mean, I no. You know, I, that's not it. So I would advise everyone, figure out what your why is. Figure out what you want to do, how you want to do it. Figure out your why. If you don't have your why, if your why doesn't really drive you what you think you want to do, find find something else to do. You know, we've had we've had so many so many folks answer, you know, a similar question over the years, and after thousands of interviews. Um, I, I'm awestruck by that answer, and I think primarily because of the authenticity of it and and the pathos by which you delivered it. It's it's extraordinary, and I think that, and I know that the millions of individuals that will see this program uh, broadcast across the world will also take hope and you know understand a bit more about the importance of why asking why ask yourself why. It is, whether it's your career decision or any pathway that you're about to pursue, why are you, why are you doing it? And so thank you for that. Mr. Ambassador, what is your post-interview ask for our global audience across the planet as we continue to collectively change the world? Ah, oh, boy. Uh... We have to, we, 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 whether or not we like it, and sometimes we don't, we have, to, we have to work together. We have to work in our regions, in the world, uh, to address some of the biggest challenges out there, whether it is development and the SDGs that we are discussing, uh, or it is fighting COVID. Simply put, no one can really deal with this alone. Um, we're all proud of our countries. Uh, but you know what? We realize that as big as our countries are, in the end of the day, alone, they are very small when you look at the world around you. And finding ways to be able to actually move that world in a direction that respects rights, respects individuals, respects openness and freedom, is not easy. And in fact, we're having backtrackings. So I'm not saying we should cooperate together and just let things be and everyone can do whatever they want to. But I am saying that we have to find a way to discuss and convince each other about the absolute necessity of joining forces. The climate, if it goes wrong, will swallow us all. COVID and the future COVIDs, if we're not better prepared to address them together, they will kill us in much bigger numbers. And development, if we don't put corruption to the side and make sure that every one of our societies actually receives money and spends it in the best way that, uh, that democratically elected governments consider, and then if it doesn't work out, then they can be elected out of office and someone else comes in. But unless we make sure that with transparency and openness, we can invest the trillions that we need to take our people out of poverty, to give a better future to our girls and to our women and to our minorities, uh, to eliminate uh, racism and, and xenophobia. Unless we manage to do all these things, learning from each other, uh, it's gonna be such a waste, such a waste of, of, of time and energy. So 
I'm going to be out there advocating to our U.S. friends here, to our European friends in Europe and everywhere around the world that we ought to be getting together and getting this done together. My gosh. Ambassador Stavros Lambrinidis, EU ambassador to the United States. Thank you for the inspiration. Thank you for the incredible insights. And most importantly, thank you for your incredible leadership. Thank you. Thank you, George.